My name is uh, Alessandro. I am principal investigator at the Italian Institute of Technology uh, in the Center for Space Human Robotics. So uh, we work basically uh, with the nanotechnology. We synthesize materials uh, from the scratch, from a chemical lab. We realize uh, electron devices which are able to read out the response of a certain kind of uh, sensors and uh, we realize uh, complete devices which are conceived for the application in space environment. I would like to talk to you today about uh, at least three projects that we have been running on this topic. Um, so case by case I will show you certain implications of uh, the material processing, of uh, the materials choice and of, uh, uh, of course of the performances of the materials uh, in a relevant environment. The first project uh, I would like to introduce you uh, is about uh, um, space debris. So the objective of the project was to realize a chaser which was able to collect uh, very big remains of a fuel tank, exhaust fuel tank, which is something like 10 meters in length and 4 to 5 meters in diameter, orbiting uh, in a low Earth orbit. And the chaser would uh, first uh, approach this uh, fuel tank, uh, understand more about its uh, motion dynamics uh, and uh, um, inertia moment and then approach it uh, with a chaser. So the chasing uh, phase would uh, happen and uh, a mechanical tight bond between the chaser and uh, the tank uh, will be realized uh, thanks to a certain uh, setup of belts. Uh, we were responsible for the sensing part um, on board, uh, mounted on board of those belts. Uh, in particular, uh, we selected a certain uh, nanocomposite materials to realize the pressure sensors, uh, which gave uh, the signal of uh, the contact between uh, the chaser and the, the exhaust fuel tank. The idea was to use nanocomposites instead of standard uh, solid state sensors, because in that case you don't have really uh, a crystalline ordered structure, but rather you have a morphose system with a fully uh, dispersed distribution uh, of uh, functional fillers inside of the matrix. Um, this is important because if you think of uh, uh, highly energetic particles or micrometeorites that could uh, heat and damage severely the material, uh, when you rely uh, on uh, an ordered structure, you can have uh, huge damages coming from this. While if you have uh, an amorphous system, uh, it is more resilient uh, to this kind of damage. So space debris is something that uh, um, could really be a problem for the future of space exploration or space exploitation. Uh, if you think that uh, um, such kind of impacts between uh, steel, uh, very, very thick steel, uh, um, layers uh, and very fast uh, small objects uh, could uh, result in uh, disasters. Um, in particular, the number of flying objects uh, have been increasing uh, tremendously in the last years because of uh, space collisions. In particular, uh, the event, uh, the anti-satellite test done by the Chinese and the Iridium Cosmos uh, collision that happened uh, uh, in 2009. So it's really a tough problem. Uh, so our approach was that of conceiving uh, um, a chaser system. So the project, the design of this chaser was done uh, within this regional framework. Uh, and um, as you will see, uh, the solution that we fought for the uh, pressure sensing uh, of the contact uh, between the chaser and the exhaust fuel tank was done on the basis of a pre previous result we obtained regarding the smart skin of robots. Um, so the main uh, objective of my institution is to realize anthropomorphic robotic systems. In particular, one of those is ICA. We tried to realize a uh, fully compliant uh, sensing skin of this robot. Uh, that means that um, uh, the appearance and also the mechanical properties of uh, this sensing skin uh, are pretty much the same as the human skin. So it's a fully flexible material, uh, nanocomposite, uh, realized uh, with the modern technologies. And um, we use the same kind of concept uh, for a space application. Regarding pressure sensors, we have 
at least two big categories to distinguish between. First one is the capacitive sensor, and the second one is the resistive sensor. So in the first case, you are having uh, the easiest structure that could ever conceive, uh, which is that of the parallel plate capacitor. Okay, so you can imagine that you have uh, a dielectric in between uh, of two metal plates, and you are applying the pressure in a transverse direction with respect uh, to the plane of the, the capacitor. So what happens is that you squeeze the dielectric and you change the capacitance associated to the capacitor. This is one mm, approach to the problem of pressure sensing. The other approach is that of the piezo-resistive materials, in the sense that uh, the resistance of a slab of material is influenced by its shape. Um, so when you apply a pressure on the material, you change the shape and in turn you change the resistance. These are two uh, different mechanisms. Uh, each one of them has its own drawbacks, of course. Uh, so depending on uh, the resolution that you need and on the speed uh, of uh, the readings that you are requiring to the system, you should ch uh, choose between the two. We had uh, a different approach somehow, so we decided to work uh, on a piezo-impeditive system. So impedance is the sum of a resistive part and a capacitive part. The idea is that, uh, like in the complex numbers, you have a real part, which is the resistance in this case, and an imaginary part, which is the capacitance in our case. <clears throat> if you are uh, using a circuit, for example, uh, whose resonant frequency changes depending on the impedance of the load, and the load is the sensor, um, you can take advantages of the, of both variations, so when you have a complex material like a nanocomposite one, which has both a resistive and a capacitive components, uh, then you take advantage reading both of them. Um, in particular, if you look at the structure of uh, uh, piezo-capacitive material, you should select uh, correctly all the components. In particular, the dielectric material should be uh, very tough, Depending on the conditions in space, you may have uh, huge temperature variations, you may have uh, uh, mm, the presence of atomic oxygen, for example, or uh, ionizing uh, radiation, uh, and also of the conductive layers. Um, in particular, in our case, we had the problem of contacting mechanically uh, a huge tank, so the mass was about two tons, uh, with mm, this uh, belt, which was flexible. We, we needed also to adapt to the flexibility of the belt in order not to increase too much the rigidity, its rigidity. Uh, regarding the piezo-resistive materials, of course, you have problems in, in selecting the correct uh, young modulus uh, of uh, the, the sensible part, uh, because uh, once again you have to match with the, the requirements uh, done by the belt uh, and by um, the uh, stiffness and the rigidity and the kinetic energy of the object uh, that uh, you are contacting with, which is a huge one. Uh, what about the conductive uh, filler that we have used? So our idea was uh, to work with uh, uh, carbon nanotubes. Why? Because the carbon nanotubes uh, are uh, pretty cheap, pretty abundant, pretty easy to, to obtain. Um, they are not very much uh, sensitive uh, to uh, atomic oxygen. Um, they could be well dispersed uh, in a polymeric matrix and uh, by dispersing uh, a huge amount of tubes uh, inside a full insulating material we can imagine uh, uh, what happens that when you apply a pressure you increase the number of contact points between those conductive uh, fillers. Usually carbon nanotubes uh, behave more or less like a metallic uh, structure in the sense that, uh, well, the conductivity is at least three orders of magnitude lower than that of a metal. But still, for, from the electronic point of view, uh, it behaves like uh, uh, a conductive material. So the, the problem now is to well disperse all the tubes uh, in a, a homogeneous insulating matrix. So what about the um, matrix that we chose to disperse uh, the nanotubes? Uh, we worked with the uh, polydimethylsiloxane, which is a very common uh, polymer. Uh, it is even used uh, to fix the windows. Um, in particular, the characteristic uh, of the silicon is that we have uh, a backbone, so-called backbone, which is realized by a perfect alternation of uh, silicon and oxygen atoms. And what makes the difference and really 
changes the properties of this uh, polydimethylsiloxane is dependent. So the, uh, the R that you see in the formula, in the chem in brute chemical formula, uh, it is, is what makes the difference. Of course, we selected a commercial resin which was already uh, available on the shelf for space applications. Um, what about the mixing process? This is very crucial because if you are not able to disperse correctly the nanotubes in the matrix, um, you, have, you end up with something which is not homogeneous, so uh, it has not the standard properties uh, uh, depending on uh, uh, the position that you characterize. Uh, and moreover, it behaves in a bad way in the sense that it's already too much conductive or too much insulating, depending on the condition. So we use this uh, planetary um, dispersion system that has uh, two rotational motion. One is a rotation along uh, the axis of uh, the crucible, let's say, and the other one is a revolution motion. So the combination of the two motion creates uh, dispersion movements inside the um, very viscous materials because the resin, before being polymerized, uh, is an extremely viscous liquid, like honey, for example. So it's even difficult to disperse uh, uh, solid stuff inside of it. So you see from the image that uh, those movements create uh, a full dispersion and in a few minutes you obtain, you end up with a completely homogeneous uh, material. After that you pour this viscous liquid into a mold. The mold has the final shape of the sensor that you want to realize. Then the mold is placed in an oven, uh, there is a curing uh, um, thermal profile that you should follow and uh, normally you go up to 120 degrees Celsius and uh, afterwards you leave uh, uh, the mold with the, the resin uh, in, uh, at the temperature for some minutes. Um, then the material is ready um, by thermal uh, initiators you obtain a, a fully polymerized material and then you are able to demold it and uh, end up with this uh, hexagonally uh, prismatic shape that we selected uh, to correctly pack uh, uh, a two-dimensional surface. So the idea was uh, to realize uh, a distribution of sensors on the belt to obtain even some resolution, uh, low space resolution uh, of about uh, a couple of centimeters. This is a cross-section view realized uh, with a secondary electron microscope system, a scanning microscope, um, of the nanocomposite material. Those tiny white spots that you see in the image uh, are the carbon nanotubes that are uh, escaping from the matrix. Okay? They are a little bit covered by uh, the polydimethylsiloxane, which is a, um, a fully compliant material uh, with the chemistry of uh, the carbon nanotubes, of course. That means that uh, um, the tubes are well wetted by the resin when it's liquid. And you see this uh, even when the material is fully polymerized and uh, you uh, break it uh, to, to look at the interfaces. Looking at the interfaces cr is crucial when you produce uh, uh, nanostructural materials because if the interface uh, was not good enough, uh, you have something which is, uh, for example, detached and the tubes uh, are completely separated from the matrix. There is no chemical bond link between them or no physical bond between them. Mm, then uh, it's like having uh, uh, two completely separated uh, components uh, that are not uh, interacting one with each other and that are not transferring uh, the mechanical uh, stresses correctly. And that means that probably in that case uh, uh, the response of the sensors would, uh, would be um, below our requirements levels. Uh, and from the sketch on the right you see what happens when you uh, apply a pressure and you vary both components, both the capacitive and the resistive component. In particular, the variation of the capacitive component, of course, is connected with the variation of the thickness of the insulating part, so the polydimethylsiloxane part, while the variation of the resistive component is connected to the increase when you apply the pressure or the reduction when you uh, remove the pressure of the contact points between the conductive fillers. Okay? So monitoring both components in the impedance measurement, uh, you in can increase a lot the sensitivity of the sensor. Let's look now at uh, the linearity, because this is, from the engineering point of view, crucial, once again. 
So the response of the sensor could be perfectly linear uh, as a function of the applied pressure or weight in our case. So we decided to characterize it in an engineering range between uh, 1 kilogram and 10 kilograms. Uh, but um, we also realized the experiments at uh, extremely low um, uh, pressures. The important is that in the engineering range, uh, this, the response is uh, linear, as you see from the yellow curve. Um, and what about the electronics? We placed also um, a particular chip which was designed properly uh, for the readout, powering and data transmission of this sensor. And we could achieve uh, interesting results in terms of power consumption. So with less than 2 microwatts, we were able to read out the um, pressure applied to the um, nanocomposite material. And this is an extremely important result in the sense that uh, um, this could allow us to uh, power the devices using uh, alternative uh, ways. Not only the standard wired system, but also the wireless uh, system, or even uh, other kind of power generation, uh, distributed power generation or local power generation. So for the perspective, this was a very important uh, uh, achievement. And this is uh, the final aspect uh, of the assembly of the belt integrated with the sensors. So we uh, used the, the sensors on one side of the belt, the same side that was in direct contact uh, with the exhaust fuel tank. And on the back side of the belt, we mounted the, the electronic chip for the readout. It's important to place the readout uh, uh, as much close as possible to the sensor because uh, you have to amplify the signal right uh, close to the material. Otherwise, if you have, uh, for example, uh, wirings which are too long, uh, you introduce uh, parasitic capacitances, so the, the linear capacitance which is associated to the transmission line, and uh, it becomes more difficult to reconstruct the signal that you had in uh, origin. That's why we decided to mount the electronics right on the opposite face of the belt in correspondence of the nanocomposite material.